please support this channel by clicking on the links below. The Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Ivan Van Sertima. The Moor, Light of Europe's Dark Age, by Wayne B. Chandler. The great empires of ancient Africa, both Kushite and Egyptian, collapsed within a few centuries of each other. After thousands of years of achievement in art, science, and philosophy, both civilizations died out within a few centuries of the birth of Christ. In addition to internal stresses and conflicts, foreign invaders contributed to the destruction of African civilization. After centuries of encouraging foreign enterprise, Egypt found herself overrun by waves of invaders, Persians, Macedonians, and Romans. In consequence, the African civilization, which had for so long inspired the world, was plunged into historical oblivion. In the centuries following the demise of Egypt and Kush, a new culture began to develop. This new culture would generate a resurgence of activity in the arts and sciences, as well as the fiery passion of a new religion. It would consume all of North Africa and would influence embryonic nations such as Spain and France, as well as civilizations already endowed with a cultural magic of their own, such as China, India, and Mesopotamia. The religion was that of Islam, and those that carried it to the corners of the East were the Moors. The history of the Black Moors and their contribution to Moorish culture had been long neglected by traditional historians. The racial makeup of the Moors in Spain, as well as the degree of cultural development of the Moors in Africa, has been disputed. In this respect, the Black Moors have been subject to the same treatment as have other African or African-influenced cultures the Olmec, the Egyptian, the Harappan of the Indus Valley, and for the same reasons. It is my intent here to demonstrate that the Moorish culture was largely black in origin, bright in its achievement, and powerful in its influence on Western civilization. Although the term Moor has been put to diverse use, its roots are still traceable. Circa 46 BC, the Roman army entered West Africa where they encountered black Africans which they called Moris, from the Greek adjective Moros meaning dark or black. The country of the Moris, Mauritania, not to be confused with the Islamic Republic of Mauritania in present day West Africa. Although obviously the root is the same, existed in what is now northern Morocco and western Algeria. The Greeks themselves, approaching from the east in search of Egypt, called the black Africans they found there Ethiops, from the Greek words Athene to burn and Ops meaning face. Ancient Ethiopia, also known as Kush or Kush, formed an empire in much the same location as the present day country of the same name. Both the Roman Mori and the Greek Ethiop indicated more than one ethnic group. Herodotus, for example, held that Ethiopians occupied all of Africa south and west of Libya. Europeans used the words Moor and Ethiopian almost interchangeably to indicate a black African. Several notable black Africans in Roman or medieval Europe had Moor as a component of their name. As Hans de Brunner notes, the outward suggestion that Mauritius might be a black African comes from his European inscribed name Mauritius, the Moor, and from his legendary home Thebaid in Egypt. Another example of the same occurs in the case of Johannes Morris, born circa 1100, vizier of Sicily. Shakespeare identifies several characters as Moors, apparently meaning simply Black African. Among them are Othello and Aaron of Titus Andronicus. The broad use or misuse of the term Moor begs the question, who were the real Moors? Or, as Chancellor Williams queried with a recognizable tinge of frustration, now again, just who are the Moors? He continues, the original Moors, like the original Egyptians, were black Africans. As Almagation became more and more widespread, only the Berbers, Arabs, and Colors in the Moroccan territories were called Moors. 
At the heart of the history of the ancient Moors of the Sahara is a tribe known as the Garamantes. According to E.W. Beauville, ethnologically, the Garamantes are not easily placed, but we may presume them to have been Negroid. Their homeland was in the area later known as the Fazan in the Sahara. Their capital city, called Garama or Jerma, lay amidst a tangle of trading routes connecting the ancient cities of Gat, Gadams, Sabaratha, Cyrene, Oye, Carthage, and Alexandria. Far from being the obscure nomadic community stereotyped in European literature, the Garamantes were one of the most redoubtable and intimidating forces of the Sahara. The origins of Garamanti culture are not easily traced. Rock engravings and paintings done by early Saharans, who in all probability became the Garamantes, are difficult to date, but some believe the oldest were executed before 5000 BC. These rock paintings show domesticated cattle, men riding in horse-drawn chariots, and javelin-armed men riding horses and camels. There are over 300 representations of men in horse-drawn chariots alone, a fact which supports Herodotus' description of the fabulous Garamantes. According to E. W. Beauville, some paintings give clear evidence of Egyptian influence. They include weapons and dress drawn in great detail as well as images of strange deities. The Garamantes, or their predecessors, occupied much of northern Africa and were contemporary with the ancient Egyptian civilizations. From this vantage point, they can be considered the ancestors of the true Moors. The earliest mention of the Garamantes themselves comes from Herodotus who describes them in the 5th century BC as being absorbed in a rather sedentary lifestyle. However, their endeavors in agriculture and commerce had already made them very powerful. In the 2nd century BC, Lucian noted their habits to be far from sedentary. They were nomads and dwellers in tents who made seasonal migrations into the remote south. They comprised tribes which dwell in towns and villages, and others which were pastoral and nomadic. Perhaps in order to protect their trade, they developed military prowess to complement their economic power. By the first century AD, Tacitus called them invincible, and Rome was in time to learn how powerful they really were. Unable to subdue the Garamantes, they actually joined them for several trading and exploratory expeditions. Again, according to Tacitus, the territory they controlled by that time constituted the lion's share of North Central Africa, their home country in the heart of the Sahara, but their territory and inhabitants occupied the perimeter of the Syrtic coast, and to the southeast it is said their range extended to the Nile. Contemporary with the Garamantes was another group called the Libyans. The Libyans, however, were originally Caucasian troglodytes who occupied territory in the far north central portion of Africa. Their presence has been documented since the first dynasty in Egypt, circa 3100 BC. Dr. Rosalie David, an Egyptologist, describes them as people with distinctive red or blonde hair and blue eyes who lived on the edge of the western desert, bordering Egypt. According to Gerald Massey, the Egyptians called the Libyans Tamahu. In Egyptian, Tama means people and created. Who is white, light ivory? Tamahu are the created white people. The Libyans' role in that illuminated epoch of African history was to provide a constant irritant to Lower Egypt. Several border skirmishes took place culminating in extensive raiding during the 6th dynasty. As Dubois notes, there came great raids upon the Libyans to the west of Egypt. Tens of thousands of soldiers, Negroes particularly from the Sudan, beat this part of the land into subjection. Sethos, a pharaoh in the 18th dynasty, again confronted the Libyan foe and subdued them. The amalgamation of the Libyans with other races may be attributed to several different factors. Surrounded by darker people on all sides but the Mediterranean Sea, the fair-skinned Libyans constituted a small minority within the black continent. 
In addition, nomads of the Arabian Plate fled their barren and drought-stricken homeland in search of more fertile lands to occupy. The blending of black Arab and Libyan produced a light brown or olive-skinned people who came to be known as Tawny Moors or White Moors, often known in history as the Berbers. The word Berber had its base in a Roman expression, Barbari. When the Romans encountered the Libyans, they referred to them as barbarians, and the coastal region they occupied later came to be known as the Barbary Coast. The Arabs later adopted the term and changed it to Berber. Eventually, the words Libyan and Berber became synonymous. Another factor in the racial blending of blacks and Libyans was the Roman intervention along the northern coast which forced thousands of these Berbers into the desert seeking protection and aid from its indigenous black inhabitants. The alliance of these racially different groups laid the foundation for the racial diversity which in later centuries would characterize the Sahara. As E. W. Beauville notes, the Romans antagonized the tribes of the northern Sahara and the desert became both a refuge and a recruiting ground for all who rebelled against Rome. The best documented example of this is that of Tasferinus, a Roman trained Libyan soldier who appealed to the Garamantes for aid in 17 AD. According to Beauville, for several years Tasferinus successfully defied the alien overlords during which time he was twice compelled to seek refuge in the desert. On the second occasion, if not the first, it was the Garamantes who gave him shelter. Beauville also speaks of a Berber tribe known as the Zenta, who under Roman military pressure migrated into deeper areas of the Sahara. So in time, the Sahara came to be occupied by two distinct groups of people, the original Moors, or Moors, and the Berbers who later became Tawny Moors. The rest of North Africa, from Egypt through the Fezzan and the west of the Sahara to Mauritania, Morocco and Algeria, were peopled by black Africans, also called Moors by the Romans and later by the Europeans. Eventually, these Moors would join with Arabs and become a united and powerful force. A period of cultural dormancy, characterized by the treachery and violence of tribal rivalry, concluded in the 6th century AD when a commanding and mystic figure arose from Arabia. Known as the Prophet Muhammad, he brought religious and cultural cohesiveness to the sword-wielding nomads of the Sahara, as he had done in his native land. The Prophet Muhammad turned the Arab tribes into the Muslim people, filled them with the fervor of martyrs, and added to the greed of plunder and the nobler ambition of bringing all mankind to the knowledge of the truth. Two central figures, both of whom were black African, did much to aid Muhammad in the dissemination of Islam. Bilal e Habesh, Bilal of Ethiopia, and Zaid bin Harith, both shared a special place in the Prophet's heart. Bilal was the Prophet's closest friend, who in the hereafter was chosen by the Prophet to protect him. It was the voice of Bilal that was used to call the Arabs to prayer. Zaid was a great Moorish general who aided greatly in territorial conquest. But before continuing the story of Muhammad and the Moors, Muhammad's native country and people must first be considered. Arabia itself had first been populated by black people. As Drusilla Houston states in her classic text, Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire, the Kushites were the original Arabians, for Arabia was the oldest Ethiopian colony. According to Houston, ancient literature assigns their first settlement to the extreme southwestern part of the peninsula. From thence, they spread northward and eastward over Yemen, Hadramaut, and Oman. In fact, the ancient Greeks made no distinction between the mother country and her colony, calling them both Ethiopia. Houston uses linguistics and physiognomy to support her contention. A proof that they, the original Arabs, were Hamites, 
descendants from the biblical Ham, from whom the black race is said to have sprung, lay in the name Himyar or Dusky, given to those that were the ruling race. The Himyaratic language, now lost, but some of which is preserved, is African in origin and character. Its grammar is identified with the Abyssinian, Abyssinia being another name for Ethiopia. Finally, Houston quotes the Encyclopedia Britannica's article on Arabia. The inhabitants of Yemen, Hadramaut, Oman, and the adjoining districts in Arabia, in shape of head, color, length, and slenderness of limbs, and scantiness of hair, point to an African origin. Stone engravings, thousands of years old, as well as modern photographs of Arabians, bear testimony to the black African characteristics bequeathed Africa by the original Arabians, the Cushite Ethiopians. According to Houston, the culture of the Saracens in Islam arose and flourished from engrafting Semitic blood under the older Cushite root. As may be expected, W.E.B. Du Bois makes some interesting points regarding the use of the word Arab. Having noted that many Arabs are dark-skinned, sometimes practically black, often have Negroid features and hair that may be Negro in quality, Du Bois reasons that the Arabs were too near akin to Negroes to draw an absolute color line. Finally, Du Bois concludes that the expression Arab has evolved into a definition that is more religious than racial. The term Arab is applied to any people professing Islam. Much race mixing has occurred, so that while the term has a cultural value, it is of little ethnic significance and is often misleading. In his native Arabia, Muhammad rallied great numbers of warriors and set out to subdue the East. Muhammad's death in 632 AD did not stop the tremendous onslaught of his Arabian Nights. They would eventually reach west to the Atlantic coast of Africa, northwest to France and Spain, north to Russia, and east to India. The Jihads, or Crusades, through North Africa claimed Egypt in 638, Tripoli in 643, and southwest Morocco in 681. With the bulk of North Africa united in the name of Allah, Muhammad's followers looked north to Iberia, land of rivers, now known as Spain and Portugal. The Arab followers of Muhammad had found many converts among the African Moors, both black and tawny, and both Arab and Moorish officers were later to lead the predominantly Moorish soldiers into Iberia. In fact, the followers of Muhammad amassed their greatest armies and some of their most outstanding military leaders from the Moors. An Arab general named Musa Nasir was appointed governor of northern Africa in 698 AD. Although he cast covetous eyes toward Iberia, he hesitated, knowing that a campaign on Iberia could exhaust his armies. The Visigoths who had earlier toppled the Roman Empire in Iberia, had ruled for over 200 years. The Visigoths were a vigorous, rather barbaric people who, as Christians, believed in religious compensation for their vices. Over time, they had become quite as corrupt and immoral as the Roman nobles who had preceded them. Yet, another obstacle stood between Musa and Iberia. An outpost of the Greek Empire, the fortress of Ciota rested on the northern tip of Morocco. This door to Iberia was guarded by Count Julian, an ally of Roderick, ruler of Iberia. Count Julian fought off all Arab Moorish attacks, and his fortress remained impregnable until Julian, for personal reasons, switched his allegiance from Roderick of the Visigoths to Musa Nosir of the Moors. Tradition has it that Roderick, while responsible for Julian's daughter's welfare during her training at his court, broke his trust and took advantage of her sexually. Julian, furious at this betrayal, quickly reclaimed his daughter and sought out Musa. Julian proclaimed to the Arab governor his intent to ally himself completely with Musa for the purpose of conquering the rich lands of Spain. He offered his own ships along with his knowledge of Roderick's defenses. While consulting with his caliph, Musa sent an exploratory mission of 500 soldiers led by the black moor Tarif. 
After the reconnaissance mission returned a success in July of 710, Musa prepared to conquer Spain in earnest. Sources indicate that Musa selected another black moor to lead the attack on Spain. Du Bois writes Tariq bin Zaid became a great general in Islam and was the conqueror of Spain as the commander of the Moorish army which invaded Spain. Stanley Lane Poole, author of The Moors in Spain, also makes reference to the Moor Tariq with 7,000 troops, most of whom were also Moors, to make another raid. On April 30th, 711 AD, Tariq crossed the Straits of Hercules with his 7,000 men, of which 6,700 were native Moorish Africans and 300 were Arabs. After landing on the Spanish coast, Tariq seized a great cliff and a portion of land around it. Deeming it strategically important, he directed the building of a fortress on the site. Tradition holds that his men named the fortress after him out of admiration and respect. The name Gabel Tariq, or General Tariq, was later corrupted to Gibraltar, and its fortress known as the Rock of Gibraltar. Tariq, leaving his fortress, ventured on to capture Algeciras and Cartea. Along his way through the countryside, he found many Spanish natives eager to join him against the ruling Visigoths. His army, rather than diminishing through attrition, actually swelled in size. On 18th July of the same year, 711, Tariq, with about 14,000 troops, engaged Roderick at the head of some 60,000 troops at the Yanda Lagoon by the mouth of Barbet. Before the battle, knowing they were greatly outnumbered, Tariq addressed his soldiers, My men, whither can you flee? Behind you lies the sea, and before you the foe. You possess only your courage and constancy, for you are present in this country poorer than orphans before a greedy guardian's table. It will be easy to turn this table on him if you will but risk death for one instance. Tariq's army won the day and proceeded to capture Asilla, Toledo, Archidona, Elvira, Cordoba, and Morcian Orabuela. According to one source, Toledo was actually handed over to the invading Tariq by the Jews of that city, who also supplied him with arms and horses. Wherever Tariq went, he and his troops were welcomed as deliverers from the tyranny of the Visigoths. In 712, Governor Musa rallied 18,000 soldiers, primarily Berbers, and crossed the straits to lend support to Tariq. Musa himself captured Cremona, Carmona, Sidonia, and Medina, while his son, Abd al-Aziz, took Seville, Beja, and Niblu. Roderick made a final attempt to regain control in 713, but to no avail. Tariq, having been supplied with reinforcements by Musa, finally crushed Roderick on the mountain range of Seguela. Roderick's death after this battle marked the close of the Visigoths' rule in Spain. According to tradition, Roderick was entombed at Vizen in present-day Portugal. The historical record clearly shows that the campaign on Spain was orchestrated by a black African general and carried out by predominantly black African troops. Du Bois makes the point that Spain was conquered not by Arabs, but by armies of Berbers and Negroids, at times led by Arabs. The Arab Moors in Spain were strikingly benevolent after their victory. The natives were not beset by Moors to change their customs, language, or religion. The Spanish retained their Romance tongue and enjoyed complete civil independence with their own churches, laws, courts, judges, bishops, and counts. The Islamic authority insisted only on the right to approve bishops. Only the Berbers, who had helped conquer the land, appear to have been unfairly treated by the Islamic State, a fact which later led to a Berber revolt throughout the empire. The first Moorish dynasty, the Umayyad, ruled Spain, or Al-Andulus, as they called it, from 715 to 750. Although some expansion of the empire occurred, Leon, 
Mekon and Chalon sur Seon were taken in 729. The focus during this period was an internal consolidation rather than external conquest. Many rival Muslim factions threatened to undermine the unity of Islamic authority in Spain. The last Umayyad caliph met his death in Mesopotamia in 750, assassinated by a Shiite Muslim. Seventy members of the royal family and court also met their death in Damascus at the Shiite hands. A new caliph, Abu al-Abbas, assumed the throne and founded the second Moorish dynasty, the Abbasid. Abdur Rahman, a nephew of the former caliph, fearing for his life, fled into exile for five years. During this time, he rallied primarily African Moors together with the aim of creating an army to lead against Spain's new caliph. Finally, in 756, he sailed back to Spain to pit himself against the ruler Yusuf. The governor of Spain was an Arab named Yusuf. Abdurrahman landed in Spain and Yusuf tried to come to terms with him by offer of attractive presents. Abdur Rahman declined the offer and both armies clashed on May 15, 756 at Musara and the African won the day. Thus, the Umayyad dynasty was resurrected in Spain. More than simply a capable military commander, Abdul Rahman proved to be a humane and effective administrator as well. Under his leadership, Spain experienced a dramatic and positive change. By ushering prosperity into Spain, Abdul Rahman laid the groundwork for the splendid edifice of Moorish cultural accomplishment erected by later generations. Land reforms were carried out which eased much of the tax burden formerly placed on the serfs. Another reform gave serfs the option of selling their property. Abdur Rahman solved the potential religious conflicts by treating Muslim, Christian, and Jew alike. Side by side with the new rulers lived the Christians and Jews in peace. The latter, rich with commerce and industry, were content. Learned in all the arts and sciences, cultured and tolerant, they were treated by the Moors with marked respect and multiplied exceedingly all over Spain, and like the Christian Spaniards under Moorish rule, had come to thank their new masters for an era of prosperity such as they had never known before. Under the auspices of Abdul Rahman and his descendants, the Moors developed a culture which in time would awaken all of Europe from its dark age. The Moorish culture was a composite culture, since the Moors indulged themselves in the acquisition of knowledge from both East and West. By the 7th and 8th centuries, the ancient civilizations of Egypt, Harappa, Akkad, and Kush had long since handed the batons of philosophy and science to the Greeks, Hebrews, Chinese, Indians, and Persians. But through these younger civilizations, the Moors learned from the older cultures. The Moors would have benefited in their search for knowledge from the world's great library of Alexandria in Egypt. Unfortunately, it was long since destroyed. History has recorded the incident. The great library of Alexandria, accidentally damaged by Julius Caesar and restored by Mark Antony, was intentionally destroyed by a Christian mob on orders of the Christian Emperor Theodosius in A.D. 389. The library at Alexandria had constituted the storehouse of knowledge of the ancient world. In spite of this, the Moors set out to quench their insatiable thirst for knowledge by translating into Arabic all they could lay hands on of ancient Greek and Sanskrit material, ransacking monasteries for rare copies of Euclid, Galen, Plato, Aristotle, and Hindu sages. An entire book could easily be filled with the accomplishments of Moorish culture. Unfortunately, neither time nor space permits such an undertaking here. But briefly, it can be said that they excelled in many fields. Their achievements in the sciences were spectacular. The Moors were the first to trace the curvilinear path of rays of light through the air. The discovery in about 1100 is a prerequisite to the design of corrective eyeglasses. Towards the end of the 8th century, 
Their endeavors in chemistry brought them to the formulation of the chemical components of gunpowder. Through its Harappan inheritance, India made clear to the Moors some principles of astronomy. The world is round as a sphere, of which the waters are adherent and maintained upon its surface by natural equilibrium. It is surrounded by air and all created bodies are stable on its surface, the earth drawing to itself all that is heavy in the same way as a magnet attracts iron. The terrestrial globe is divided into two equal parts by a equal nautical line. The circumference of the earth is divided into 360. The earth is essentially round but not of perfect rotundity, being somewhat depressed at the poles. This is the Indian calculation. These principles recorded in a Moorish translation of an Indian text would not be comprehended by the rest of Europe for 400 years. The Moors pursued practical applications as well as the natural sciences. The use of the astrolabe and the compass revived again at a later period in Europe were common to Moorish navigation. European military science was revolutionized by the introduction of artillery and firearms. The Moors were also known for their skill in medicine. For seven centuries, the medical schools of Europe owed everything they knew to Moorish research. Vivisection as well as dissection of dead bodies was practiced in their anatomical schools and women as well as men were trained to perform some of the most delicate surgical operations. They amassed much information in the study of the functions of the human body and cures of its diseases. Moorish Spain also excelled in city planning. The sophistication of their cities was astonishing. According to one historian, Cordova had 471 mosques and 300 public baths. The number of houses of the great and noble were 63,000 and 200,000 of the common people. There were upwards of 80,000 shops. Water from the mountains was distributed through every corner and quarter of the city by means of lead pipes into basins of different shapes made of the purest gold, the finest silver, or plated brass as well into vast lakes, curious tanks, amazing reservoirs and fountains of Grecian marble. The houses in Cordova were air-conditioned in summer by ingeniously arranged draughts of fresh air drawn from the garden over beds of flowers chosen for their perfume warmed in winter by hot air conveyed through pipes bedded in the walls. Bathrooms supplied hot and cold water and there were tables of gold set with emeralds, rubies, and pearls. This list of impressive works appears endless. It includes lamp posts that lit their streets at night to grand palaces such as the one called Azara with its 15,000 doors. Such a well-developed culture depends on the efforts of talented people. A black African Moor named Zaryab is representative of the fullness and variety of Moorish culture. Zaryab was a Renaissance man before the Renaissance. He entered the country of Al-Andalus in 821. He was skilled in both arts and sciences. A celebrated musician, he is credited for improving the lute by adding an extra string, making five in all, and also for founding a great school of music. A botanist as well as a musician, it is Zaryab whom asparagus lovers may thank for the introduction of this delicacy to Europe. In addition, Zaryab excelled as an astronomer and geographer. According to one historian, his memory was prodigious. He was, moreover, gifted with so much penetration and wit. He had so deep an acquaintance with the various branches of polite literature. He possessed in so eminent a degree the charms of polite conversation and the talents requisite to entertain an audience, that there was never, either before or after him, a man of his profession who was more generously beloved and admired. Kings and great people took him for a pattern of manners and education, and his name became forever celebrated among the inhabitants of Andalusia. Zaryab evidently was an innovator within fashionable circles. Zaryab was a leader of fashion in the most civilized court of Europe in the early half of the ninth century. 
He set the fashion of changing dress for four seasons of the year instead of for only two, as was the custom before his day. Being a connoisseur of food and drink and its accoutrements, he introduced the fashion of being served on crystal instead of on gold or silver. Some of Zaryab's fans were very highly placed. According to one historian, he was renowned throughout Spain, and on one occasion when he came to Cordova, the Sultan himself, to show the respect which he held for Zaryab, rode out to meet him. With the contributions of individuals such as Zaryab, Spain flourished, but amidst the beauty and wealth, a socio-political plague was spreading. Jews who had been slaves now began trading in slaves. According to T.B. Irving, between the years of 786 and 1009, Franks and Jews traded Slavs and Germans who had been taken prisoner on the Frankish territories. The Slav and slave became interchangeable terms. They, the Franks and Jews, made young boys into eunuchs at Verdun. The slaves were driven from France to Spain in great herds like cattle. When they reached their destination, the men were purchased as servants or laborers, the women as household help or concubines. Many women were also imported from Galatia, for their blonde appearance attracted the Arab gentlemen. Slaves were also traded from out the Adriatic. These captives too were Slavs, and their merchants chiefly Christians. This slave trade changed the racial mix in Al-Andalus. The use of European women as concubines gradually lightened the complexion of Moorish Spain. Through these various processes, Moorish Spain became more Caucasian in blood than is generally realized. It was always blonde women whether Slavs, Germans, or Galatians, who were in special demand. This practice was not exclusive to Spain. W.E.B. Du Bois notes that during the 16th century, the Mohammedan rulers of Egypt were buying white slaves by the tens of thousands in Europe and Asia and bringing them to Syria, Palestine, and the Valley of the Nile. White slavery became widespread in Spain, Africa, and the Mediterranean. The polygamous family structure common to many African cultures expedited the process of amalgamation and the consequences wrought havoc upon the inhabitants of Al-Andalus. Licentiousness and immorality became more and more prevalent in the Moorish social structure. Predictably, there was a gradual eroding of virtues, philosophy, and the pursuit of cultural excellence. Though Abdul Rahman did not encourage or personally patronize the slave trade, its continued persistence within his empire inevitably led to its collapse. Concerning this matter, it has been said, This penetration of the black race by the Caucasian was facilitated not alone by the dominant position of the African race, but also by its tendency to polygamy. Abdul Aziz ibn Musa not only wed the widow of Rodrigo, for which he was murdered by the Arabs, but took many Christian virgins for his concubines. On the other hand, Romero II of Leon, fascinated by the beauty of a Saracen maid, slew his legitimate wife and married the exotic creature by whom he had a numerous progeny. The two cases were typical. On the one hand, a violent penetration of the conquered people by the polygamous invader through their womenfolk, and on the other, the attraction exerted by the Saracen women upon men of the defeated race. Abdul Rahman was succeeded by a series of comparatively ineffectual rulers. His son, Hisham I, ruled from 788 until 796. During his reign, the Christian independent kingdom of Asturias in southern Spain became a source of trouble with which Hisham had to deal. He, in turn, was succeeded by Abdul Rahman's grandson, Hakam I, who ruled from 796 to 822. This period was characterized by many minor social upheavals which led to a series of revolts. Abd al-Rahman III ruled from 912 to 961 and was followed by Hasham II, who during his reign stepped down in his place. Spain was ruled by one Al-Mansur from 981 to 1002. 
in 1009, civil disorder tore asunder the empire of the Umayyads. Divided now into separate principalities, the sultans ruled independently, one from the other, which caused great loss of both military and political power. This made them vulnerable to attack by hostile Christian factions. In 1031, the caliph was dethroned and the Umayyad dynasty came to a close. It had lasted for a period of 270 years. With the collapse of the Umayyad dynasty in Spain, the security of military and political structures also came to an end. The Moors found themselves at the mercy of Christian expansionists who had been waiting for the opportunity to recapture territories long lost. The rising threat of Christian intervention and dominance began to create an air of fearful consternation amongst the inhabitants of Al-Andalus. During this period, as fate would have it, a strong and powerful movement was stirring in the African Sahara. This force would proliferate so rapidly that it would consume in time all of the central and northwestern sections of the continent and play a major role in the history of the Spanish Moors. As stated earlier, many of the Berber tribes had been forced into the deeper recesses of the desert. The consequence of many wars in northern Africa had been to force down certain Berber tribes upon the confines of Negro land. They eventually mixed with black Africans who occupied the same territories. This fusion brought into being some of the most proud, brave, and fearsome clans of the desert who were identified by the wearing of a veil around the face. From time immemorial, says Ibn Khaldun, the mopped demim, or wearers of the veil, had been in the sandy desert. The mopped demim formed seven orders of the northwestern desert, and during the reign of the Umayyad dynasty, they were already a powerful nation obeying hereditary kings, which ruled in what came to be known as the Desert Empire. There came to the throne of this empire a black ruler of the name of Yaha ibn Ibrahim. Being a Muslim, he tried to convert his subjects from their traditional African religion to Islam. Yahya and his subjects were not Arabs, they were indigenous African people. In 1048, Yahya made his pilgrimage to Mecca and upon his return brought back with him for the instruction of his people a religious leader. Ibn Yasin. Ibn Yasin endeavored to instruct and convert Yahya's people, but the lack of interest they had towards Islam, coupled with the harshness and severity of its disciplines, only served to aggravate them. Finally, they rebelled and cast out Yasin. Ibn Yasin and his followers left and established themselves on an island in the Senegal River where they lived as recluses. They became known as al Murabatin, which meant people of the Ribat. It is this word that became corrupted in Spanish as al -Muravid. In time, his community attracted great numbers of people, and when their number reached 1,000, Ibn Yasin declared a religious war against their non-Muslim converts. This time, they met with limited success. The Almoravids converted numbers of Sudanese Negroes but gained no political control over them. Among the converts was the king of the Mandingos. In 1042, with Yahya serving as general, they began to conquer West Africa and when their numbers were 30,000 strong, Ibn Yasin invaded Siljumasa, which was his home, and began to move northward towards Morocco, which he also conquered. However, misfortune plagued the Almoravids after this period. Yahya died in 1056 and was replaced by his brother Abu Bakr, and the following year saw the demise of Ibn Yasin. Abu Bakr furthered his conquest until he had an empire which extended from the Senegal in West Africa to Morocco on the Mediterranean coast. In 1061, Disorder broke out along the southern fringes of their desert empire and Abu Bakr hastened home to restore order, leaving his northern territories under control of Yusuf ibn Tashifin. Yusuf was Abu Bakr's cousin and so naturally was a black African. 
Du Bois describes him. Yusuf, their leader, the Almoravids, was himself a Negro. The Rude El Cartos, a Moorish work, describes him as having woolly hair and being brown in color. Yusuf proved to be a wise and capable leader. In the year 1062, Yusuf laid the foundation of the town of Morocco with his own hands and not long afterwards declared the independence of the northern kingdom of which it was to become the capital. Thus, a black moor appropriately founded the city of Morocco. By the year 1082, Yusuf had long been hailed as the supreme leader of the northwestern portion of the African plate. But in the interim, from 1062 to 1082, much had transpired to the north and south of him. To the south, in 1076, Abu Bakr had attacked, sacked, and pillaged the empire of Ghana, bringing to a close one of the glories of Sudanic Africa. And to the north, in Spain, Alfonso VI took Toledo and swore to drive the Arabs into the sea at Gibraltar. Yusuf, Content with the empire he had established in his homeland, apparently never once contemplated assault on Al-Andalus. But within the later half of 1082, hundreds of Moors and Arabs had flocked back to Africa to escape the tyranny of Alfonso and the persecution by the Christians. These men, with tears in their eyes and sorrow in their hearts, had come to Yusuf to implore his protection. Finally, in 1083, the governor of Seville, Al-Mutamid, came and begged assistance against the Christians. Yusuf consented and amassed one of the most formidable armies seen by either Arab or Moor. It is stated that when Yusuf crossed to Spain, there was no tribe of the western desert that was not represented in his army, and it was the first time that the people of Spain had ever seen camels used for the purpose of mounting Calvary. Being that Yusuf was black and the western portion of Africa was also predominantly black, it was only natural that the core of those he enlisted would be black. The author goes on to say, forming the army which fought at Zalaka in 1086 were thousands of blacks armed with Indian swords. This battle drove the Christian forces out of southern Spain and laid the foundation for Yusuf's Spanish Empire. Yusuf marched onward to Seville, where he found the state of its inhabitants abhorrent. It strikes me, he commanded, that this man, meaning the king of Seville, is throwing away the power which has been placed in his hands. Instead of giving his attention to the good administration and defense of his kingdom, he thinks of nothing else than satisfying the cravings of his passions. Soon afterwards, Yusuf left Spain and returned to Africa. Later, he was informed by his generals that they, his army, were doing the whole of the fighting against the Christians, while the kings of Al-Andalus remained sunk in pleasure and sloth. This infuriated Yusuf, and he ordered his generals to conquer the kings of Spain and set in their place governors of their choosing. This officially ushered in the third Moorish dynasty of Spain, the Almoravid. As Flora L. Shaw exclaims, Once more a supreme sultan sat upon the throne of Al-Andalus. His conquest and the dynasty which he founded must be regarded as an African conquest and an African dynasty. The Almoravids ruling in Spain were identically the same race as that which moving from the west established kingdoms along the courses of the Niger and the Senegal. Yusuf ruled both Spain and Africa until his death in 1106, when he was succeeded by his son. Thus, the Almoravid dynasty continued to reign with a double court, one in Africa and one in Spain. For years, the Almoravids carried on the splendor that had always characterized Moorish Spain. All taxes were abolished in Africa and trade flourished. The Almoravid Empire was one of great prosperity and learning but lasted for only a century. Yusuf's son, being inexperienced, lost the throne and the African dominion was overthrown in 1142. The Spanish dominion fell three years later in 1145. 
This gave rise to the second great African dynasty to rule Spain and the fourth and last Moorish dynasty, the Almohade. Under the Almohades, who also hailed from the western fringes of Africa, Moorish glory in Spain was well maintained. Great monuments were constructed, the most treasured being the Tower of Seville. Grand observatories as well as splendid mosques were built. African rule in Spain was at its summit in the Almohad period, during which the greatest philosopher of the Middle Ages reached his maturity, Abu al-Walid Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Rashid, had been known in the West by the name of Averroes. He was an African who lived in Spain. There were numerous outstanding African scholars in Spain throughout the Muslim period and because of them no European country came close to Spain in terms of cultural brilliance. Averroes lived from 1126 to 1198. He was a celebrated medical scientist, jurist, theologian and astronomer. Many of his works, because of their excellence, were translated into several languages and he developed a philosophy which came to be known as Averroism. Averroes' heyday was the lull before the storm, for the dynasty of the Almohads had grown extremely passive amidst the lavishness in which they had grown accustomed. This gave new incentive to the Christians to rally their legions and subdue the Moors once and for all. It is stated that no less than three million Moors were banished between the fall of Grenada and the first decade of the 17th century. Valencia fell to the Christians in 1238, Cordova in 1239, Seville in 1260. Though the last dynasty had perished from Spanish soil in 1230 and the Moors exiled from a land nurtured by their culture and wisdom, their influence was felt in Europe's schools of medicine, mathematics, and philosophy for 200 years. At the moment of the final expulsion of the Moors from Spain, the Catholic Cardinal Jimenez ordered the destruction of the libraries. As one author so brilliantly exclaims, the misguided Spaniards knew not what they were doing. The infidels were ordered to abandon their native and picturesque custom, to assume the hats and breeches of the Christians, to give up bathing and adopt the dirt of their conquerors. The Moors were banished and for a while Christian Spain shone like the moon with a borrowed light. Then came the eclipse and in that darkness Spain has groveled ever since. So ended the empire of the magnificent. The Moors had ruled Spain for 800 years. Others have given a different analysis of the Moorish empire's racial makeup and history. According to many European historians, all civilized Moors were actually Tawny or White Moors, whose ancestry could supposedly be traced through olive-skinned Arabs to Europe herself. For example, although historian John Crow acknowledges that Africa begins at the Pyrenees, he is quick to qualify this statement. One must be careful here to specify that the Africa here referred to is not the lower part of the dark continent peopled by black men. It is northern Africa, the ancient homeland of the Iberians, of the Carthaginians, a Semitic race, of the Jews themselves, and of the Moors, composed of many Arabic-speaking groups. For these historians, or for their audiences, much is to be gained from these elaborate constructs. The theme underlying all these inconsistencies is that white culture is superior to black. The technique in each case is to separate the black African peoples from their achievements. Thus, the ancient Egyptians, architects, builders, and scientists par excellence are Mediterranean types. The Ghanese kingdom, one of the most stable and developed in Africa after Egypt and Kush, was masterminded by a white royal dynasty. The kingdom of Ghana was of considerable age, having had 22 kings before the Hijara and as many after. The ruling dynasty was white, but the people were black Mandingo. Of such a statement, there is no possible way to measure its absurdity. The Moors, whose military prowess conquered much of the East and whose religion caught the souls of millions of people, are held to be white or swarthy, but never black. 
In each case, the race and its historical contributions have been divided. Another tactic of European historians bent on affirming the superiority of their civilization is used in those cases where the origin of a culture has already been acknowledged as being black African. This tactic involves the denigration of the accomplishments of this black African civilization. Yet another tactic of European historians has been to ignore African civilization altogether. A History of Modern World, published in 1950, serves as a typical example of this approach. This 902-page book devotes a grand total of eight pages to the history of Africa, or rather to the story of the partition of Africa following the 1805 conference at Berlin. As the text states on page 639, in 15 years the entire continent was parceled out, with the exception of Ethiopia and Liberia. The remainder of the continent belonged to one of the European powers. The flyleaf of the cover apparently unwittingly gives the author's definition of the quote-unquote world mentioned in its title. The book is described as a brilliant and highly readable history of modern Europe in its international setting. The same text will also serve as an example to illustrate another blind spot of European historians. The authors, who were educated and taught at Ivy League schools, are aware of the impact of Europe on Africa, but not of any significant reciprocal current of influence. Thus, the European colonization of Africa is discussed, but the influence of ancient Egypt on the Greek-Roman civilizations is ignored completely. This essay has attempted to transcend the obstacles inherent in quote-unquote discovering African history. Napoleon's observation that history is a set of lies agreed upon is particularly apt in relation to African history. The challenge posed by this research was to sift through the prejudices discussed above prevalent in much of the available materials, while stubbornly pursuing knowledgeable, objective sources which seem to be the least accessible. Amidst the ignorance, fabrication, and prejudice lay pearls of truth regarding the bright achievements of Africans and African culture. This essay has deliberately placed emphasis on the role of black Africans in Moorish civilization rather than the civilization as a whole. During the research for this paper, however, it became clear that Moorish civilization in its entirety had suffered in the eyes of the world on account of its African heritage. In an attempt to set the record straight, highlights of Moorish achievements in general have been included. Moorish civilization should take its place beside the other great African or African-influenced cultures, Egyptian, Harappan, Kushite and Olmec. Al-Andalus had a special role to play in history. After the Roman Empire's collapse, Spain was like a riverbed gone dry. The rising sea of Moorish culture, saturated with the wisdom of the ages, replenished the riverbed and formed a mighty waterway. This river of Moorish civilization through its tributaries regenerated the surrounding land that was medieval Europe. Thus, ushering in a great rebirth of cultural activity. Thus, through their gift of the Renaissance, the Moors constituted a link between the ancient civilizations and the modern world. End of chapter 4 The Moor, Light of Europe's Dark Age by Wayne Chandler Read by Exam Info Please support this channel by clicking on the links below.